met this senior monk who really captured my imagination. He was like a bit of an Indiana Jones type character, very dynamic, um, had a real grasp of like this ancient philosophy that kind of, he could explain in a way that when I looked out the window into the street in Dame Street in Dublin, it kind of talked about ancient stuff, but it, I could see it in real life today. And so I just thought, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll make a little film about what we're doing. So I kind of made a one hour documentary that's a, I made a one hour docu, so it wasn't like a one minute film, it's straight in there, one hour documentary. In, in a way, my life, until more recently, um, was always kind of a bit of a yo-yo, because it was like growing up in this very entrepreneurial environment, wanted to be a stockbroker, then becoming a monk. Then I kind of was 29, I had no money. I felt a little bit materially I needed to catch up. I didn't have inroads into the industry either, so we kind of created our own way around it. It didn't, it almost didn't even really matter if we weren't always getting paid for it in the beginning because we were, we were creating content, we were creating examples of work. Two years later, we were streaming at uh, TEDx at the Royal Albert Hall with seven cameras. <laughs> I mean, we were so lucky. It all went perfectly, but my God, it was, we were, it was quite scary. Then we kind of hit a streak where we won the Drum Recommends um, under 40 staff video production company of the year six years in a row. Um, so I will always say that to young people, like start creating short films. So Rav, it's great that we can finally talk. Um, I've been meaning to want to talk to you for quite a long time, really. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is, is kind of your journey mm -hmm. into what you do. And then I want to explore a little bit deeper just what it is that kind of is the distinctive around who you are. But maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Ireland, in Dublin, as um, uh, I was given the name Ravenel, which straight away <laughs> made me, I guess, feel... Um, I never, it never bothered me too much, but I suppose there, there is a sort of a weight to it. You know, I always felt a little different from everybody else. Also, my dad got into macrobiotics when, in 1972 in Dublin, um, which is kind of the equivalent of veganism now. So we were very different like that. We didn't eat any sugar, any dairy, any uh, meat. Um, and um, grew up quite happy. My dad was an entrepreneur, um, worked a lot, worked every Saturday, um, strong work ethic. I kind of grew up then with a sort of, um, he was in the hairdressing business, so it's all very glamorous, quite materialistic and stuff. And he sort of chased success. And I guess I looked up to him in that way. It, it sort of was, had a certain idea of, of success and it was the 80s and kind of wanted to be a stockbroker. <laughs> like was really sort of drawn to that whole thing. Um, but deep down, I think there was a part of me that um, was really keen to try and understand I guess the essence of what being alive and, and life was all about. And I can't remember asking my mom as a, as a young kid, like sort of existential type questions and through my teens, it kept being a burning thing. And um, I remember one of my friends invited me to go to um, a temple when I was 15 in Dublin. I went along, I, I, on the way to, the, to it, I got beaten up by some punks though. <laughs> And they smashed the milkshake on my head and all. It was all a bit. So when I went, I was quite distracted. Um, I kind of like the food. They have vegetarian food. and But um, I, I didn't really revisit it um, for quite a while. But funnily enough, later on, it, I kind of came back to it. Um, so I had I, in my school, there was a very interesting thing. Um, it was called a transition year. So you, you could go straight from equivalent of O-levels to A-levels. Or you could do this transition year. It's kind of like an experimental thing. Mm. It was all about personal development and, you know, retreats and um, uh, what else did they have, like poetry and kind of reflective debating, all that stuff. And um, I remember really enjoying it and um, kind of, I guess it took me out of the normal flow of things a bit and got me kind of again, maybe off that totally materialistic track. Um, so this transition year, it kind of, it got me reconnected with maybe like the questioning stuff about doing something a bit more meaningful in life um and then i ended up going to university and doing a degree in psychology 
um, and studying happiness and this is my kind of driving thing and then in when I was just nearly 21 I met a, a senior monk I went back to the, the similar temple it had moved around the corner and um, met this senior monk who really captured my imagination he was like a bit of an Indiana Jones type character very dynamic um, had a real grasp of like this ancient philosophy that kind of he could explain in a way that when I looked out the window into the street in Dame Street in Dublin it kind of talked about ancient stuff but it I could see it in real mm. life today so I found that very compelling like that this ancient knowledge was seemed relevant to to modern life so when you talk about the temple what, what are we talking about here yeah so it sounds like yeah exactly so when we're talking about in Dublin we're talking about essentially a storefront like a shop type front so you'd go in in the window they had these quite nice displays um sort of like they had a display where there was like a little baby and then a, a, a youth and then a teenager and then an adult and then the, the body goes down into death again and it was kind of like talking about the cycle of how the body uh comes from dust goes to dust but there's a sort of a spark that it runs through it like the idea of the soul um and um, so you'd go in and then there was like they'd have Indian clothes and like all kinds of trinkets and incense and little elephants all that sort of stuff um, and a little shop and then at the back there was a sort of um, a temple room with a little altar and then behind that was a kitchen and a shower and, th and then the monks lived downstairs. To be honest with you I loved going but I would have never in a million years joined and just lived in there. Uh, it, well, it didn't inspire me. I mean I, li I liked going but I would have been a Sunday guy you know. Mm. <laughs> Um, but then he said to me one day, uh, I've just been traveling around and uh, he used to put on uh, festivals for the public, uh, cultural festivals. And he said, oh, you could have come with me. That was it for me. I thought, really? That sounds exciting. And then essentially I did that for seven years. I spent two years in Africa, a year in India, and then the rest of the time traveling around Ireland and England. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was really, it, it was intense, but it was quite amazing. I mean, what, what looking back at that now and maybe thinking about as we'll, we'll <clears throat> catch up in a minute in terms of where you end up going, mm. what were the what what are the things that have stayed with you through that? Through that, um, I guess the, the the main biggest one is, and I know you 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 you've sort of grown up with faith or you found faith, is um, is kind of like this huge mega backdrop to everything that helps me to make sense of things. So like there may be a lot of things on the canvas that are changing or that are difficult or sometimes very challenging or whatever else, but it gave me a kind of a big framework within which to um, understand things. Um, and so that's something that is, because I don't, I don't sort of do it to the same level these days as I did in those days, but it, it kind of, I feel like it was a real immersion as well because it was so full on. So it's kind of like um, the, the it, it left a very deep imprint on me on a deep level. So it's still there. It's, it's foundational. It's foundational, yeah, yeah, that's a good way of saying it, yeah. So talk us through then, how, how, how through that journey <laughs> do you find yourself as someone who starts to become interested in media and film and content creation, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, it's funny because um, Recently, I, um, uh, my dad, when, I, when I, we were kids, like maybe I was eight, um, had one of these kind of uh, shoulder kind of camcorders. And recently I got a lot of that footage digitized. So I realized when my dad wanted to be in the shots, he would give it to me. <laughs> so I, that was when I would have a go at the camera. But also, um, as a monk, we were in Africa for two years and we were doing work there that I thought was you know, important. We were doing work with street kids and education and all kinds of good stuff. And I thought, we, we always, obviously part of what we had to do was raise funds to do the work. Um, I thought, well, um, and my mentor, he was always interested in media as well. So he had this really cool thing. We used to call it Krishna Vision. It was nine different old school projectors with the, the slides that went in them. And they were programmed by a computer so that, and they were, there was a sort of a, I don't know, it would be like a 60 foot by 20 foot screen that we would put up. Um, sometimes in the slums of Africa and all over the place. And these projectors would all uh, had music, really loud music with it, and they would all interact across this huge screen and kind of create uh, this amazing movie but from nine different synchronized projectors. So he was really into that kind of thing and he bought a camera. And so I just thought, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll make a little film about what we're doing. 
So I kind of made a one hour documentary. Um, and that was in nine, um, 95. That's a, oh, I made a one hour documentary. <laughs> it wasn't like a one minute film. He's straight in there, one hour documentary. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was. I mean, it was it was pretty good, but it was um, it was sort of primitive as well. Like, mm. it, it, but it helped me to like kind of understand like when you're seeing a scene, like to find an eye for you know something that's going on, and you know trying to get a wide shots and then zoom in on things mm. and stuff. And um, the visuals, I was really good at editing, and but because we were editing it in a primitive way, the, the sound was the hard part mm. because it was we weren't really recording sound separately. You know, it's just so. Um, I had, uh, when I got back to the UK, there were two VHS machines, put the Hi8 onto one VHS, and then was record, uh, editing bits from one VHS onto the other. And it's quite tricky, actually, because there's a bit of a delay. Mm. So when you press engage to record, there's a sort of like a second or two seconds before it actually starts to record. So you have to try and get used to that. Um, but essentially, you're blocking bits on bit by bit onto this other VHS. Um, and so while visually it, it kind of tells the story very well, I didn't have any way to independently um, smooth out all the sound and stuff. So sound-wise, it was a bit choppy. But um, otherwise, it was pretty good. <laughs> so we, um, of course, though, we had to post VHS tapes to people or get them into a room and, and watch it together, which, and it, it was effective. It was good. Um, then I, I, when I, so the two questions people always ask me about the monk life is why did you go into it? And also, though, why did you leave it? Hmm. So I think um, the, the funny thing is uh, youthful uh, idealism and kind of um, gung ho kind of made me want to do it for my whole life. But in actual fact, the funny thing is when you look at the traditional culture that it comes from, um, mostly boys from 5 to 25 would, would be like monks like this. They'd go to the home of because it was all small scale the local home of the teacher they'd learn material stuff but they'd also learn about spiritual stuff but at 25 almost without fail like, apart from the very odd exception they get married mm. because it's kind of like the next phase of life they talk about it as four phases of life um so that the very rare person would be cut out to do that their whole life you know because it's such a high level of commitment um yet not young and innocent and naive we thought oh we can do it you know um, but, but really like traveling all the time, having no base even to have a bookshelf or any sort of stable place. Um, we were celibate. It was um, my, you know, women sometimes talk about their body clock, <laughs> telling them maybe they, I think my body clock was telling me as well, like, uh, this has been incredible, but actually uh, you're ready for the, the next part of your life. Um, and there's actually a lovely story that is often cited, uh, you know, an elephant is very strong, but he's strong on the land. So if he goes too far into the water, then a crocodile who's not as big and strong as him can get him because he's not in his na he's not in, he's not best situated for his his nature. So it's that thing about at different times of your life you need to make sure you position yourself where you're best positioned to be strong. And so uh, while the student life and all of that taught me so much about like. You know, depending on you know God and and kind of um, also working and sacrificing, working really hard, but not for yourself, for like a higher purpose, and and also trying to share that with other people and stuff. So uh, we can talk about it maybe later. But like it, it sets you up in a brilliant way for have, to have a spirit of service and giving. But it also, when you do go out into the world of working and stuff, um, sometimes you can over give then because you're just sort of defaulted a bit like that. Mm. Um, but anyway, um, but, but just, to, I mean, you, you talked about your dad as an entrepreneur and yeah. you grew up with all of that and you wanted to be a stockbroker. <laughs> I mean, now you, now you're living a life where you I mean, you have no possessions, yeah. you know, absolutely committed to this thing. It, it is a, a life of glorious poverty yeah. in a way. Yeah. But I mean, what was that teaching? Cause obviously there was something about you that wanted to succeed and wanted to do well, wanted that, the material kind of benefits that came with that and now mm. you're living something very different so mm. how did you navigate that yeah it was it was a challenge then coming back out into you yeah. know what you might call you know uh, civil life or whatever <laughs> um secular life but um it was hard i often think of it like you know when they talk about um spaceships coming back into earth's atmosphere you know in the movies they always bounce around and it's quite turbulent so 
so it was it was like that it was it was a real um it was a real learning curve like because we especially it was different times but we didn't we didn't listen to the radio didn't watch tv didn't read newspapers i didn't know who the prime minister was didn't know nothing um so kind of just having to reintegrate and i got my first job in a in a um so to talk about like in, in a way my life until more recently um was always kind of a bit of a yo-yo because it was like growing up in this very entrepreneurial environment wanted to be a stockbroker then becoming a monk then i kind of was 29 i had no money uh, at all and so it was kind of like um i felt a little bit materially i needed to catch up and my dad uh said to me he got involved with property a bit he said you know, you need to learn about property and get into property. Uh, so I did three years as an estate agent, as a sales negotiator, but I was earning like 10 grand a year. Um, but I was learning about it. And then I got a little bit of help from my dad and I was lucky. I kind of invested and it, it, was, a, it was a rising market and then reinvested and um, got a bit of a foothold, which was, which was, which was fortunate. Um, but I kind of, after those three years, again, felt like I'm drawn back towards more of the work that was about with working with the community and stuff. So I did three years in Wolverhampton with um, running mentoring programs for young people who were kind of at risk of getting kicked out of school and stuff um, and loved it. And again, that was the first time I heard the word sustainability, interestingly, because we were getting three years of funding um, and then it was going to end. And we're working with vulnerable communities and they would kind of say to us, like, we've seen this before. We're kind of a bit sick of this because... You come along, some project comes along, bit of funding for a bit, does something, and then you go away because the funding is not long term. And so how could you make projects like this sustainable? Um, but then again, I made a film again of the work that we were doing. Didn't really make it sustainable, sustainable, but got more funding so it could carry on. And I kind of heard about the term social enterprise at that time. That was like 2003. And um, it was quite exciting in, in concept. Because it was this idea that you could do the social work, but you could kind of trade and that would bring in the money and then you would have to be less dependent on grants. The only thing was, in practice, I saw a lot of times um, the people who were running them were really well-intentioned and had all the good heart, but they didn't always have the sort of business skills. So they often did have to lean back on funding a lot, which is fine, but it wasn't all that it was hoped it would be. So that, so I kind of, even though many people, uh, so, so to, to rewind a little bit, I went back to university and um, in Aston Business School in Birmingham and did an MBA, which is like a business master's. Mm. Um, and I was actually quite fortunate, even though I had a bit of money from the properties, my wife Tina, so I got married around that time as well. She, um, she was working as a teacher and that actually enabled me to do that. Mm. I, um, she, 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 we've we've sort of uh, talked over the years and kind of like I wouldn't have always been I wouldn't have always told you that I wouldn't have always seen the story like that it's quite interesting I would have thought like oh, I I did my business and I made it all and I was the one with all the success and everything but actually um, I couldn't have even started it if it wasn't for her you know at that time doing that um, and then I came out the other end of the, the MBA and um, decided I wanted to do something but I wasn't sure what exactly i kind of knew i wanted to do something that was um going to have some kind of social impact w from it but didn't know what it was so it's funny now we're talking about those different moments where i had a camera in my hand but i hadn't even i, I wasn't even thinking about those mm. but then looking backwards sometimes you just start to join the dots mm. and i went oh actually there was that and there was that and there was that um maybe i'll start a film company that is about trying to tell stories about that about that are in the community or in even in business as well that was starting to happen where they're trying to do something good and that was the birth of being inspired films mm, that's amazing mm. I'm, I'm always really surprised about how people find life navigates them into that space where they become a creative you know start doing mm. those things and you know, people often think oh well, surely you go to university and train or you go to film school you do this and Actually, there's so many different journeys that people take that bring them to a point where actually that just feels like that's the fit for them. Yeah, you know. And so, then, so you're very, but you're very early on here, like you said, in terms of the whole notion of. I mean, OSBD started back in the '90s, and eventually in 2001, we became a charity and a limited company, which was the 
yeah, in a yeah, way. Yeah, that was ahead of the then, curve too. That was ahead of the curve in the sense of I, I as a kind of entrepreneur knew that what I wanted to do was be able to trade and make money that we could reinvest back into the into the charity. Yeah. So, um, but you know, this stuff was still really early on, wasn't it? So, was yeah. it was it a battle trying to kind of find a a niche in that or a, a kind of a corner in that in some way? In some ways, I think, so this was around 2008. So it was a bit later, but it was, as you say, it was the first time where I, oh, so in my, in my MBA researcher did it on venture philanthropy. Okay. So that was, again, another indicator that people in business were looking at charity or impact in a way that wasn't just, here's a check. It was like, how can we bring our networks? How can we bring our knowledge? How can we bring our rigor, our measurement, our um, all of the things that have helped us to be successful in business and look at how can we help try to make giving it more effective? Now, that comes with its own challenges because obviously they're totally different sectors and different things drive people in the different sectors and all of that. But there was, I think, good intention, certainly, and good that came out of it. Um, so I kind of... Um, I was quite excited though, because if you think about it, in me, myself, I had these two, what could be seen to be quite opposing things. So to see something outwardly that was bringing them together in a kind of meaningful way gave me a lot of inspiration. And I thought, yeah, this is kind of, this is, this speaks to me, or this is sort of feel where I'm, I can bring them both into play. So I started, and to be honest, in the beginning, we, I was very lucky actually, I, th I would say, because there was an organization called Unlimited with a foundation for social entrepreneurs. And I, alongside Be Inspired Films, I had started this thing, Be Inspired Consulting as well. And um, Cliff Pryor, who's now the head of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, at that time he was the um, CEO of Unlimited. I met him at one of these, well, there was a thing called Oxford Jam, which is very interesting. It just sort of shows you that the lesson here, I suppose, is to be curious, explore, go to stuff where other people are. We did for three or four years in a row, this thing called Oxford Jam. It was a fringe festival to the Skull World Forum in Oxford University. Skull World Forum was a big global, very high profile thing, you know, Bono would come and all these kind of people, Clinton, you know, and talk about impact. But there was a but there was a sort of a fringe festival to it, which was very much on the side. People couldn't get invited, couldn't get into it, but were still interested in that kind of stuff. And we went to it every year for three or four years, and we uh, filmed over the three or four days. We edited overnight and showed a film at the end. We did that every year free, completely free. And it wasn't like we thought we were doing it for free. To be honest, we were doing it because we loved, we were excited, having fun doing it, and it was good fun. Um, and it was me and myself and a chap called Anthony and um we but it's interesting because all of those people who were there that kind of gave birth to a lot of the people who are now leading organizations in that sort of niche um but equally um i met cliff Pryor there and he i uh, was telling him about what i was doing he said oh we we want to do a 360 degree um analysis of our organization and so we want to interview 40 ceos of all of our main partner organizations and uh, he gave me that role to do it. And I went for it. I mean, I think in two weeks, I mean, these are CEOs. I managed to get all of them booked in, did them all, um, and then presented, uh, synthesized all the findings or whatever, presented it back to them. But now I'd kind of become visible mm. to all of these people. Mm. Um, and I think that's my main strategy. If I was ever to kind of, the, the power of niche, of course, is that it's a much smaller pool, but it's very deep. So like I knew I couldn't, I didn't really want to, but I couldn't really compete with every production company because we were, but I didn't want to either. Mm. You know what I mean? So um, I always give the analogy that if you are able to go to a birthday party and you could only be there for 15 minutes, but you wanted to the most people to see you, where would you stand? So I always think the analogy, you, you, you'd find the birthday person and when they were cutting their cake, when everyone was going to be looking at them, you'd stand beside them. <laughs> so it was the power of kind of partnerships. Yeah. Um, so we did, uh, we did different partnerships. And in the beginning, you know, we, we did it for free as well. But it was, we, especially umbrella organizations. And then later we got asked by those organizations to become partners. And then after a while, we'd say, well, we can't do it for free anymore. We do it for a discounted rate and whatever. But like, 
we we would they would give us huge billing as um, you know. So for example, the Institute of Fundraising, you know, three thousand charities every year would gather, um, and we were giving our time over a couple of days, and we would calculate the commercial cost of that. And then they would give us, you know, incredible billing, like on this big stage with Jon Snow would be speaking and it would have The Guardian be inspired films. And, you know, and we, we couldn't have paid them yeah. to get it, you know. So we did a lot of that in the beginning. But, but that's that entrepreneurial. It is. I mean, I was just talking to some young filmmakers today exactly about that, about mm. thinking left field. Mm. You know, everyone will tell you this is what you've got to do. You've got to do this. But actually, there's often another route through. Mm. And, and I think it goes back to that thing you talk about the elephant. You were absolutely making sure that you were in a place of strength rather yeah. than putting yourself in a place of vulnerability. I mean, not that vulnerability is bad, but no, putting but a place of, where yeah. you might not be able to actually achieve the things you're setting out to do. Well, imagine if I'm at home and I'm, no one's ringing me, no one's emailing me, um, which I can understand a lot of people will be in this position. They think I'll put up a website and sort of sit there and wait. Um, that is a vulnerable position mm. because you can get um, you stuck with your head, right? You know, <laughs> you know, you know, like you know. Um, whereas if we were out there and we were doing all these things, first of all, we were busy and we were enlivened, and we were enjoying it, and we were meeting people, and we were putting work out, and we were being visible. Um, so it didn't. It almost didn't even really matter if we weren't always getting paid for it in the beginning because we were. We were creating content. We were creating examples of work. Um, so I will always say that to young people, like even if it, even if you know it's just you and some other students that have graduated, start creating short films. Because imagine you meet someone and you say, "Oh, well, I'm, I'm." Well, imagine you meet two different people, right? You meet one, and they say, "Oh, yeah, graduated. Yeah, I'm just. I don't know. There's no opportunities. Whatever, whatever." And you're thinking, "Yeah, yeah, it's tough." And then you meet another person that are saying the same stuff, but they're going, yeah, but every week we, we're just making films. Mm. We're out there, we're doing stuff. And, you know, we, we've made a few crap ones, but we're, it doesn't really matter, you see, because they're learning, mm. you know, and you can see that drive and that, and that kind of, the person who, it, there's just such a different effect on the person well, who hears it. it. It's attitude, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, everyone talks about you can't teach attitude. Yeah. You know, so if your attitude is that you you want to be getting out there and, like you said, get involved, be doing things, whether that's to begin with doing things for free because actually it's just giving you fantastic access into a space, you're doing something you really believe in mm. and that sense in which that then will potentially grow and become something else. Or, it, you, know, or you just meet people mm. and mm. it is an industry, isn't it, where knowing people is so important. And again, people get so fixated on, I need to know great directors, I need to know great producers, I need to know... Yeah. But actually... Everybody in the world is trying to tell stories. Everyone in the world now wants to create content. Mm. So actually, there's an awful lot of people you can go out there and get to know that might then be people that want you to do something for them. Oh, but sure. a lot of people just fall into those silos. Of, well, these are the people I need to know. But actually, they're not the people necessarily who are going to want you to do something. No. And also, I think it's interesting too, because I can kind of now see um, more value in you know, the industry and understanding how the industry works I suppose there's a little bit I was a little bit I don't think I was arrogant in my attitude but I I kind of because I didn't have inroads into the industry either and it wasn't like I didn't I wasn't going to be able to break it forward in the industry industry I kind of had to I told myself a story that I don't care about the industry because it wasn't a route that I could see an easy way into so we kind of created our own way around it um, and now I can kind of see, as we've done bigger things like, you know, huge crews and doing adverts and stuff, that there is a lot of stuff that you can learn about the industry that's important, and especially when it gets to bigger crews and stuff. Um, but I don't think you... I think you're really missing a trick if you want to jump to that. Like, it is a ginormous lump mm. from zero to that. It's just massive. And so I think sometimes, like, um, when you're learning about, um, you know, the craft and stuff, it's... Yeah, I think you sh you need to sort of, it's good to know it, but I would hold it loosely, if you know what I mean. If you're sort of too rigid with it, then you're like, oh, well, I can't do that because this is my role, or I'm this role, or I'm, you know. You, you, you have to kind of let go a lot of that until yeah. you really become a specialist, if you do become a specialist. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and just sort of uh, be flexible and be, be adaptive and, you know, that's, yeah. I think that's, that's absolutely critical. Mm. I think you've, you've nailed it there. And a lot of people... 
again think oh i've got to do it you know by this by this by this by this and yeah it's not that and it's and actually i think the thing that you've got to be really careful about is that don't let go of life and fun and (laughs) excitement do you know what i mean it's like because it is a in, in its widest sense this industry or whatever sector whatever we want to call it where there's which is so broad now in the sense of content creation, making things. Mm. Of it, it, there's so much opportunity, but you're absolutely right. Don't ever sort of say, oh, that's not the right opportunity. Oh, that's, that, that's not really where I fit. Because it could be meeting people, learning stuff, experiencing stuff, seeing stuff. And mm. actually, when you eventually do come to a point where whatever it is you're doing, whether you're specializing, setting up your own production company, mm. building onto bigger things, all of that is so essential to understanding how things work and and having a sort of, a, I suppose, a, an ability to also, can, I think, not be arrogant in that space, but yeah. appreciate what everybody does from the runner through yeah, to yeah, yeah. whoever. You know? Yeah, and I think especially if you're, definitely if you're a producer, but in any role, really, um, it's really good to understand what everyone else does and mm. how it impacts. I mean, I remember... Uh, hearing about like when older camera guys would talk to younger camera guys and they would say have you spoken to the editor after you gave the footage and they go no but no you should because they'll tell you uh you didn't get enough coverage or you you we we needed a bit more close-ups or or we needed you to hold it for longer or whatever Mm. it is Mm. and 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 nothing i mean it might seem like things happen in isolation but they're all Mm. so much connected you know um and actually, um, especially as a producer, because I've done a lot of in that role, if you're talking to a client, you can't bring in your camera person and your editor to talk to the client and everything else. So you need to have enough knowledge about all of those things, what's possible, what's not possible, or what's possible at a certain, how much time it's going to take or cost, um, so that you can talk to that client confidently. Um, and then, sure, you can go back and you can talk to those other people, but you you, you need to be able to, in the moment, have, have enough of, uh, mm-hmm. breadth of understanding to confidently have that conversation um, and so it's crucial that you understand a bit enough about all those mm. other things so we we know the journey that you've come on mm. and a bit about your background and, and what's brought you into this space and you've obviously set up the company you're doing all of these different things just give us a bit of a kind of a, a, a quick kind of bring us up to speed in terms of what you've learned where you're at now what you're doing what's important to you yeah. as someone who is involved, you know, within the filmmaking industry? Mm. Well, I'll just give a teeny bit of an, a flavour of some of the kind of work we, we ended up doing. So we we always did um, short form films, so like little mini documentaries, case studies, little impact films, you know, storytelling, mostly like a mixture of interviews and B-roll and, and like that. We also did animation quite early on as well. Um, so we were quite lucky we... I don't know if people will remember, there was an RSA animate style. Uh, so it was basically that hand-drawn mm. style when it was all done from scratch. Um, so we found this cool animator down in Eel Pie Island in Twickenham. <laughs> so we used to go across onto the island with her, Sheba. Um, and we learned how to do that style. And it was a style that now later became like, you know, you buy um, kind of uh, whiteboard type cheat ways to do it and stuff but we did it fully from scratch and we learned how to do it and then we would learn ways to kind of like not just have the drawing but then funk, funky things to happen within the animation in between or a hand to come in and move stuff or unfold pieces of the paper and then that would become part of it it became a kind of cool little thing that we would do did um but early on we used to do a lot of events but my colleague vince who was a friend he was also a monk actually um he um got into streaming like way at the beginning so he actually got into it because he learned how to do it because he was out in the paddy fields of west bengal on a kind of a pilgrimage and he would figure out this kind of backpack thing and it would he built a kind of a tower and he was able to kind of um stream like this is talking oh god what would it have been 2009 10 and stream this live so people could watch it so we, we became uh, partners with TEDx East End. So TED Talks obviously were quite a big thing. Um, and then they would have some of the kind of higher profile ones in the UK. We, we, again, we met through this Oxford Jam. So we would normally film it um, in this TED style, you know, with multiple cameras. Um, but Vince said, why don't we just 
test out the streaming thing. So we did it on one year. That was probably 2011. Two years later, we were streaming at uh, TEDx at the Royal Albert Hall with seven cameras. <laughs> I mean, we were so lucky. It all went perfectly. But my God, it was we were it was quite scary to be asked to do it. And um, we were going in for meetings with them and felt out of our depths. And, you know, it was quite scary. But we um, we did it and it was amazing. So we'd have a live director on comms with all the cameras you know, repositioning cameras, getting different shots. We, we had a wireless camera and we, it was a huge stage at the Royal Albert Hall and there was a couple of performances, musical performances where they had three different instruments that would happen. And so we had it all choreographed. So Dave, um, who actually was a cool guy we knew who used to film for like Coldplay and stuff, he, he would sort of um, come on for these bigger gigs and just sort of help us out a bit. So he was on camera. Um, and he would be uh, for, for the first bit on this on this thing and then he'd run across to the other side and we'd cut back between like that. It was really fun. They did another cool thing where we rigged a camera from the ceiling of the Royal Albert Hall and he was going to, somehow he linked it up to his computer and he was going to do this thing where he'd ask the que- audience different questions. So some of them would be standing up, some of them would be sitting down and then his computer on this camera would scan them somehow and play a, a melody. <laughs> all this quite far out stuff like stuff that now would really freak us out to like to even try and in the morning we set up on the morning normally would nowadays we'd always set up the day before um we i remember being in the sub stage of the royal albert hall and it was this patch base and it was all quite archaic and we would be plugging them in and then we'd have cameras way up in the gods and we'd be going shouting out does that one work no that one doesn't work (laughs) try to plug in the next one you know but anyway it all came together and it all went brilliantly well. Um, and that was a big milestone. Um, and then we started to do all kinds of stuff, um, you know, for, for Google or in Southeast Asia. We'd be doing stuff in India for different impact investors. We filmed stuff in Africa for different charities. We um, were filming all over the UK. We started to train um, people inside organizations to create some of their own video content. Um, so we were really, really, really busy and on the road all the time for many, many years. And um, during that period as well, we started entering into different competitions. And in the beginning, we kind of narrowly missed and really disappointed. And then we kind of hit a streak where we won the Drum Recommends um, Under 40 Staff Video Production Company of the Year f- six years in a row from, I think it was 2016 to 2021. <laughs> so wow. that, was, wow. that was like pretty awesome. Yeah. It was good. And it also felt especially good because we were up against all the production companies and because we were, you know, not massive. Mm. And also we were doing, we stuck to our guns on what we wanted to be about, which was about trying to tell stories of impact. It felt great. Mm. It was really nice to be able to to kind of um, get that recognition as well. And I presume along the way you've had the privilege of sort of mentoring and training a lot of people that have come through as well. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Um, I would always go and do talks in like universities and schools and we'd have um, different people come on, you know, and help out. And I had a couple of apprentices and different things. Yeah, definitely. I was always keen to um, help like from the technical side, but also as a producer, as a, as a business. I, I always enjoy actually trying to share with younger um, people about the business side of it as well, because so hard mm. as a creative person in any field to try and do something creative also sort of follow your passion that's a bit of a cliche now but like that kind of and make money mm. um forget about it, like you know just make enough money so that you can keep doing it and then if you can make more money than that and and and, and do well then that's even better but like even just to to, to be able to keep doing it is is, is very elusive for a mm. lot of people so yeah, I'm always kind of keen to share that if I can. What would you say when you when you think about the whole journey that you've been on? Um, mm-hmm. What would be the kind of two or three really key things that you would say have been the anchor points mm. for you in terms of being able to do what you do and mm. keep it going, do it over a you know a long period of time, be successful, yeah. you know, keeping going, still being, you know, sort <clears> of <throat> out there seeing the landscape, seeing where the possibilities are. What, what, are, what are the few things that you think have really kept you anchored to be able to do that? I would say you can't underestimate a, 
um, a pretty intense work ethic. <laughs> it's like working really, really hard. Now, I'd have my own thoughts on that now, but it's also to do with your age. Like, when you're young, you've got loads of energy. Um, and, um, of course, there's more of a consciousness now about work-life balance and stuff. And you, 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 you need to do that to the extent that you keep good mental health. But, you know, there's also nothing wrong with, like, working hard and working mm. a lot, especially when you're building, you know, because, like, you're never going to, like... Um, like, let's just say, for example, people talk about doing like the three peaks in, in the UK or whatever, like these kind of climbs. Some of them, you have to do them in a day. So you've got to get up there and back down in a day. So there's, there's, a, there's a time period. Now, if you to go, oh, well, we'll have a couple of picnics on the way up and whatever else, like, you, you, that'll be nice, but you're not going to get up and back down mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to, at certain times, you set yourself a goal and you kind of, um, you know, you will have to overextend yourself and, you, you know, you might ache in pain for a couple of days and whatever. But those are sort of all part of the 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 ups and downs or the ebbs and flows of trying to achieve something extraordinary mm. um and if that's what you want to do mm. um and i suppose it's just oh but you see there could be huge peaks but there may be then periods where you have to take a little rest or a bit of a break and re- recuperate only and the individual knows wh- what yeah. you know what they need to do um but i do think it's something you should have on your radar like you don't want to burn out Hmm. Um, but you are going to have to work hard. But you are going to have to work extremely I mean, hard. Do you, do you think, as I often say to people, it's in the midst of that, what you need are some some good people around you that you trust, that can just, you know, really believe in who you are and what you're doing, but they will, mm-hmm. they'll they will be the voice of reason to go, that you know, it's great, you're working hard, you go, but actually, you need a holiday, you need a bit of a break, you need to step back, or, you yeah. know, but... Or, or maybe just, you know... Um, this is a bit of a golden period, just push right through yeah, yeah. while you've got it. Yeah, uh, you know, so it depends. But uh, yeah. definitely someone like that you can talk to, yeah. who isn't going to just give you one answer, but who you can have an honest conversation yeah. with. That's really important, I think, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and I think, um, so that's hard work, you know, for sure. Then I'd say kind of innovation, I suppose, mm. you know, so for example, and I, I won't always credit myself with all of those decisions, but being around people who can bring you different ways of looking at it. So, I mean, I know the whole thing about um, training people in organizations to do it, to do films. I, I got the idea myself, but it what the instigation for it didn't come from me. So I was, I had some uh, guys who were working with me, like James, Anthony, Scott, at the time, and they were going in and teaching kids in schools to make films. And I just thought, well, that's interesting, but why couldn't we do that in companies? Mm. But so it's just kind of like, I suppose, like you said earlier, being open to it's like a cross transfer, isn't it? Mm. If it works in one context, it might work in a different context, and no one else might have thought of that, for example. And then the streaming, for example, I credit that to Vince completely. And Vince and I still work together on it today, which is which is great. Um, but he was kind of he, he's a kind of a shy guy, he's a very techy guy. But together, you know, it was a good combination because I could kind of take it out to the market, but he knows it a billion times better than I do. Do you know what I mean? So um, that was another thing. And the interesting thing about the the training was. It never made us a huge amount of money, but it got us into organizations at a lower price point in a way where we were giving and it helped us to build relationships that then led on to other work. In the end, I gave it up, though, because um, it was taking up a lot of time. um, And also then we were kind of becoming more known for that when it was supposed to be a side thing. Um, But it was we had so many great years. We loved doing it and it was it was brilliant. So I would say so hard work, innovation. And then I think um, passion, you know, and I guess that goes in hand in hand with attitude. Mm. Sort of, um, it's a really tricky one because I meet a, a lot of um, younger people now who are coming up and like on one hand, I really admire their, they have more, they have boundaries, which is good. So they're kind of like, this is my rate and that's my rate. Um, and like, that is a good thing. It, 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 uh, on the whole um, but I think also sometimes if it's too rigid it, it can be a breaking point for working with someone who wants to give you work 
Um, so it's, it, but it's this whole thing, isn't it? It's a tricky balance for people because it's talking about my value. Like you're not valuing me properly. And the thing is, is that that, that is a really valid point. <clears throat> but at the same time, um, it's about having a relationship where you can build trust. And, you know, sometimes I'll be able to pay people more and sometimes I won't. It depends on the job. So, and they all obviously have the option to do it or not, not to do it. Mm. But I just feel like once you can get past the fact that like it's not, I'm not uh, trying to disrespect you and take away, the money part of it away from attaching it to our value, um, but be able to have um, um, straightforward discussions about money mm. is important too. Because I think money is a very one of those weird things where a lot of us grow up uh, feeling uncomfortable talking about it, feeling uncomfortable around it. And then if we muster up the energy and the courage to talk about it, it's like, that's it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I think that, so I would, I, I, it's sort of a bit of a meandering point, but I, I think my point there is, is to, to have a really collaborative attitude, be really straightforward and frank about what you want, but also be flexible. I think. I, th I think what you're talking about there is, is really, I mean, absolutely, mm. uh, so many people ask me, I don't know what I should charge, Pip, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting, sometimes they are wanting to charge way more than actually they ought to be charging at that point in their career yeah, yeah, yeah. for the skill sets that they've got. Um, and obviously there's a whole thing around sustainability in terms of how can you sustain yourself in, in the craft and what you're doing. But you're absolutely right. I think I'm, I'm you know, nearly 59 years old. I've been doing this for more than 25 years. I still do things for free. Yeah. I still do things with what I call sweat equity, where it's something where I think there's a real, there's a really great idea here. There's a great opportunity. Um, there's a, a group of people I really want to work with. And I will still choose to do an element of that in the hope that maybe something develops into a project where I can raise money and we can mm -hmm. go forward. So I still do that. And so I often say to you and people, don't, don't invalidate the idea that there will be projects or people or things that you do mm -hmm. where it might require that bit of sweat equity. And if you, as exactly as you're saying, if you're so rigid, say, so well, oh, well, no, that's going to take me four days to be involved in this. Well, that, that's mm. my rate. Then what actually you're going to do is miss that opportunity. Now, absolutely, you have a choice in that. Mm. But if you're coming together a bunch of group of people where there's a real sort of honesty around an integrity, yeah. that there's not one person here that's taking a whole bunch of money whilst a bunch of people are all doing it for free, but mm. there's a group of people that are all agreeing to set out on a journey together on a particular mm -hmm. basis that might grow into one of the best things you ever do with your life yeah. so I, I totally agree with you but th there's a real balance there mm. and and you have to be careful that you're not being aligned with people who perhaps will take advantage of you so yeah knowing knowing the people you're working with is really important and you may make a few mistakes yeah you, of course you, you may will. try someone and it doesn't work out or whatever yeah. but I think um as a as a, especially if it's someone new that I haven't worked with before, like attitude is so important because first of all, you're bringing that person in front of your client who you might have worked a year to, to win. Um, and, you know, if, they're or, if you're already getting into a thing of like hard lines, you know, and you haven't even started, then you're worrying, well, what are we going to, what's going to happen if we're on the set and we have to do an extra 20 minutes or something? Like, mm. you, know, you know what I mean? It's just, it's concerning. You know what I mean? Um, but the beauty of everything is, is that, and I, ha I want to do it more, actually. I haven't done it enough. It's something I've often thought about, is after every job, um, I want to try and make it really simple. I want to kind of turn it into like maybe a, like a simple Google form or something that's all nicely branded. But like to get everyone who was on the job, ask them for feedback. Mm. What went well for you and what could we have done better? Mm. Um and I haven't done that enough, if I'm honest, but I mm. think that that's a really valuable thing mm. because then what you're going into is you're going into a relationship where, you know, we commit to do this together. And, you know, there might be some things that don't work out as brilliantly as we would want them to, but we can make them, we can improve mm. that mm. if we agree to carry on together. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's very much about relationships. Like, you know, you, you, you get into grooves with people and you kind of get a shorthand and, you know, you sort of, um, you know, that, um, you know, sometimes you'll be looked after, but other times, you know, you might have to go the extra mile and, and whatever. Mm. And those are great. Those are fun relationships, you mm. know, to have. Yeah. Well, Ralph, thank you so much. I've been wanting to talk to you 
for the uh, kind of the OSBD podcast for such a long time. I think you've taken us on a really interesting journey through so many different things. And mm. I think for those of you who will be listening to this, you would have learned an awful lot. So thank you so much. That has been a real pleasure. Thanks for chatting to me. All right. Thank you.